The topic for this lecture is Bihar's Development in Comparative Perspective. The chairperson for this lecture is John Harris, Professor Simon Fraser University, Vancouver, and the speaker is Jerry Rogers, former director, International Institute for Labor Studies, Geneva. The lecture will be for 40 minutes, and then we'll take question and answer for 10 minutes. Okay, so we're starting at 20 minutes past, uh, past Thank you. so going on until 10 past 6, right? Um, it gives me actually huge pleasure to be chairing this session uh, and to introduce uh, Dr. Jerry Rogers uh, because we have been friends for a long time. Indeed, Jerry reminded me yesterday that it is 30 years almost to the day uh, that we were doing research together on labor markets in climate. Um, but uh, probably unlike many other speakers in this, uh, in this conference, here in Bihar, I think Jerry Rogers needs very little introduction uh, because he has been doing research in this state for, um, well, more than 40 years, I'm sure. Um, and indeed, uh, Jerry and his wife uh, Janine have done a whole series of studies of a number of uh, villages uh, in, in Bihar. Um, one recent publication of their work is in a book uh, that Jerry uh, co-edited on longitudinal village studies uh, in, uh, in, in India. A long time international civil servant, I suppose I can say, in the International Labour Office. I think one of Jer Jerry's most important achievements is having been, I think, one of the most important architects of the idea of decent work and what that should mean uh, that has been developed by uh, the ILO in, uh, in recent years. So, Jerry, the floor is yours. I hope the, uh, the PowerPoint is going to work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, John, and uh, thank you also to Shaibal Gupta and, and colleagues for, for the invitation to this, uh, this conference, which is really a privilege and, uh, and, a, and a pleasure because it's the 25th anniversary of Aladri, but I think it's um, the 35th anniversary of an association of friendship with, with Shaibal and, uh, and his colleagues. Uh, and um, so I'm really, really happy to to be here, and um, with with so many other friends as well. So the starting point for my lecture uh, is, and I think for, for many people it would be, is, is the the impressive performance of Bihar in the last decade, and um, the the exceptionally high rates of, of economic growth, the improvements in governance, the strengthening of social policy. It, it's a source of admiration for all of us who like to think of ourselves as, as friends of Bihar. And that there, there are no half measures here. When, when things go well, they go remarkably well. And that, of course, refers not only to high rates of economic growth today, but also to the glories of the distant past. It, it, it applies also to the extraordinary achievements in culture, which are widely appreciated and valued around the world. And, and Bihar, Bihar is also peopled with its sons and, and sometimes with its daughters, the upper echelons of bureaucracy, of, of medicine, of science, and business, um, many domains in, in, in India and, and beyond. But there have also been times, of course, when um, where this has been the part of India where feudal exploitation has been most intense, where levels of violence have been highest, where economic growth was, was painfully slow, and where poverty obstinately refused to fall. And despite the recent progress, Bihar still ranks low 
on, in terms of both human and economic development. Now, I'm going to try and talk about the transition from stagnation to growth and its sustainability over time. And I'm going to take a longer term perspective. Uh, I'll start with some, some personal observations on development in Bihar, personal observations uh, which draw on my own visits and stays here over the last almost half a century. Uh, th then I'm going to look at some other development paths and contrast them with Bihar's experience. I'm going to look at, uh, at Tamil Nadu and I'm going to look at Brazil. I hope that these contrasts will help us understand some of the ideas, some of the possibilities, some of the processes that might, um, might be, at, be at work. The, these, are just, these are just illustrations. I'll explain why they are interesting uh, illustrations a bit later on. Um, but, um, but perhaps, I don't know if I need to justify making these contrasts. Is there a value to, to contrast the experience of, of Bihar with, with other states and countries? Because every, every experience is, is historically specific, socially, socially unique, uh, and you have to be careful about reaching strong conclusions um, about situations which are not the same. But where development paths have diverged, where they converged, it can be stimulating to try and explore some of the factors that, that have played a role. This conference is about Bihar and Jharkhand. I'm going to be talking mainly about Bihar. Some of what I say may be relevant for, for Jharkhand too, but mostly the focus is on Bihar. So, I worked in Bihar for longer periods at three points in time. First at the beginning of the 1970s, uh, then in the early 1980s, and more recently uh, over, the last, over the last decade, with shorter visits between these, these longer states. In, 70, in 1970, uh, Janine, my wife, and I worked here with a, with a group researching the possible impact of the Cozy Canal system uh, in the wake of the drought and famine of the 1960s. Uh, the countryside was stagnant, it was deep in poverty, economic conditions were absolutely appalling, wages were set by the minimum basically to keep the labor force alive and, and working, the local landlords concentrated economic and political power and had little interest in development that might undermine their position. A decade later, in the 1980s, we returned to some of the villages in the same area of northeast Bihar. Um, there had been very little progress. Uh, rural poverty was just as deep. There wasn't much time for urban or industrial development which might offer alternatives. A, l a large survey of the rural areas in the state, um, across the state, undertaken with um, Graham Harishankar Prasad, and in which uh, Shadal Gupta also participated. In, in that we found that in some areas there was, some areas were doing a little bit better. Um, the poverty was spinning over into violence, the state was ineffective, the future looked pretty bleak. Then we didn't come back for a, a while, and returned towards the end of the 1990s and found a remarkable transformation. Uh, people were better fed, better housed, wages had risen. There had been some rise in agricultural productivity, but the primary reason was large-scale temporary migration, labor circulation, to other parts of India, and the consequent arrival of market forces in the villages, in the village economy. A access to employment outside the village that undermined some of the methods of semi-feudal control and generated the infusion of cash and information. But this did not, on the whole, translate into investment and the growth of productive capacity locally. And in the course of the last decade, more surveys uh, undertaken by the Institute for Human Development in Delhi has shown, has shown further improvement. Uh, for the first time, there was effective state action at the village level, delivering social benefits, rising education for both boys and girls, investment in infrastructure. Uh, in some areas, 
for instance, uh, around, around town. But there was some local development of agriculture and other activities and increased commuting to urban jobs. But especially in North Picard, the orientation remains very much outward with migration, essentially of men, to other parts of India on a massive scale. Women's economic options remain very limited. Because of this circular migration, there was a considerable flow of remittances into the households in these villages, which raised levels of income and consumption, but there was little sign of a dynamic process of private capital accumulation. That's a very sketchy and quick summary, but, but in, in order to interpret observations of this sort, we need to try and put them in the context of the growth regime in Bihar as a whole. The growth regime in the sense of, of the wider set of institutions that govern the pattern of investment, employment, growth, and the distribution of benefits. Now, up to the 1980s, you could say that Bihar had a, a, rather, a rather autonomous but stagnant growth regime of its own. And then, in the 1990s, there was a strengthening of market forces in the production system and in the labor market. There was a restructuring of power relations, and in particular, a reshaping of the caste hierarchy. And there were improvements in, in governments, which ultimately led to a new growth path. But despite the improvements in economic performance, urbanization and industrialization was slow, private investment didn't take off, and growth was concentrated in trade, services, and construction. So the resulting growth regime was in some sense incomplete. Bihar supplied labor to the rest of the Indian economy without becoming a destination for industrial capital. There was an unbalanced incorporation of the state into the national economy, which was not necessarily to Bihar's advantage. Meanwhile, elsewhere in India, as we know, liberalization generated rising growth rates long before the same happened in Bihar. And the state fell behind. Now this graph shows output per capita in Bihar as a proportion of the All India average from 1950 onwards. What we see is that in the 1950s and 1960s, Bihar's per capita output fluctuated between 60 and 70 percent of the All India average, lost a little ground in the 1970s, but by the mid, eight, late 1980s, it was still around 60 percent of, uh, of the India average. Then as India started to grow faster, Bihar failed to keep pace for, for 20 years, with an SDP per capita dropping precipitously to between 30 and 40 percent of the Indian average. Now, at the end of the right-hand side of this graph, we see um, the impact of the high rates of economic growth, which have started to reverse this trend in the last few years. Um, but can this be sustained? Um, can it be sustained? There's no simple answer to that, to that question. Um, but that's the point of making some comparisons, to try and get some ideas of what might have happened elsewhere. I'm just going to get my water. Now, in, within India, traditional, traditional approach to this is first of all comparing across states in India. But there are many possible comparisons because within India every state is different. So for purposes of comparison, I'm uh, going to make some comparisons with, with Tamil Nadu. At my risk and peril, because there are a number of people in this room who know a great deal more about Tamil Nadu than, than I do. And also because there are large social and institutional differences between Bihar and Tamil Nadu. But actually, at the time of independence, Tamil Nadu was not much better off than Bihar in economic terms. And some, some elements were common. Go governments in Bihar, I think this was already mentioned this morning, was at least on a par with that in the Madras presidency at the time of independence. And there's, there's a story, perhaps an apocryphal story, that uh, a group of ICS officers were sent from Madras to, to Bihar at that time to study administration of governments. Um, 
The tenant had to eventually establish the development path that combined higher output growth with extensive social policies and declining poverty, long before the half started to do the same. It, this graph shows the relationship between output per capita in Tamil Nadu and Bihar separately in relation to India. So 100, the 100 line is the All India Average. And Tamil Nadu uh, in red from 1980 up to the present Bihar in, in blue. And what we see in 1980 was that um, the gap between Bihar and Tamil Nadu had not widened very much since 19, around 1950. Um, about 50% difference compared with about a 40% difference in, uh, in 1915. So that there wasn't much change in the relative position of the two states in, in those three decades. Um, but then, of course, after the 1980s, um, those curves diverge. Uh, Tamil Nadu participated in the acceleration of the Indian economy, while Bihar did not, to the point where 20 years later, um, around 2010-2015, NSDP per capita in Tamil Nadu was almost four times that in Bihar. Uh, I think it's important to note that that difference in output per capita exaggerates differences in living standards. In this graph on the left, we compare Bihar in blue and Tamil Nadu output per capita, then the two Bar, sets of bars in the middle compare household expenditure per capita and the right hand compares wages. So the gaps in expenditure and wages are much less than the gaps in, in output. And there are a number of reasons for that. One is, one is high levels of remittances into the high households, where there are high remittances into Tamil Nadu as well, but they're, they're higher in the high. Uh, another is the size of the corporate sector in Tamil Nadu, which sucks part of it a lot of uh, outputs, a lot of increase in value added that doesn't actually reach households, goes into the corporate sector. So a number of reasons. But all the same, that the gap is there. The gap, the gap between those two states is there, and it's real, and you see it here in a graph of the trends in, in poverty in the two states. Once again, these are poverty in the states in relation to the all India average. So if we take um, uh, what happened to uh, Tamil Nadu in, in red, we see that around in the 1970s and 1980s, Tamil Nadu was around the average level of poverty. The poverty rate in Tamil Nadu was about the average in, uh, in India. And then from the 1980s onwards, it started to decline very systematically. So it's down to about 50% of the all India average by 2011-12. In Bihar, which Started off in, 19, in the 1970s, not much different from, from Tamil Nadu in terms of poverty, the opposite occurred. Of course, poverty rates were falling. This is in relation to the All India average. So, but in relation to India, Bihar diverged upwards. The gap between the two states increased. Now, why? It's it, it, much to say to fit into a lecture to, to explain the reasons for these trends. But let me just pick out a few, a few points. Um, as independence, the points of departure for the two states were different. Uh, Madras was already a major port. Um, the, the region had much better communications than Bihar. There's the infamous freight equalization policy, which um, which offset Bihar's advantage the costs of coal and, and steel. But in addition, the, the agrarian structure changed faster in, in Tamil Nadu than in Bihar in the years after independence, with more effective land reform, and a growing and influential middle class peasantry in place of upper caste landlords. Now, that happened in Bihar too, but much later. Um, so, as a result, in this period between independence and, say, 1980, um, agricultural production grew faster in Tamil Nadu than, than in, in Bihar. And then, of course, the other important difference was there was already a much larger and growing urban population in Tamil Nadu and an industrial base, especially the textile industry in Coimbatore. Um, so, 
a number of reasons why Tamil Nadu had some advantages at the start. But in fact, in the, that period up to around 1980, the state didn't take full advantage of that favorable starting point. The economic performance up to 1980 was only slightly better than Bihar and still below the All India average. The Tamil Nadu did make progress, important progress in one critical respect. Um, the, it put in place some of the preconditions for the subsequent acceleration of growth. Probably the most important of all was substantial investment in education, which started when Kamaraj was, was chief minister. And as a result, today, Tamil Nadu has among the highest education levels in the country. Secondly, there was a serious effort to spread opportunities to all sections of society. Uh, reservations in public sector jobs and educational institutions were implemented effectively and early, not only for Dalits but for OBCs with the highest share of reservations in the country. Third, there was an important push for food security with the introduction of the Midday Meals program and the early implementation of what has today become the public distribution system, which has continued under successive state governments, uh, clearly serves the interests of middle and lower strata, has clearly contributed to cronyism and corruption, but has nevertheless been an important factor in the state's good performance in poverty reduction. Uh, another important area of difference was in the labor market, migration of landless labor to urban areas in the decades before independence, form the nucleus of a non-agricultural labor force, and then partly as a result of the investment in education and social policy and high female labor force participation, fertility started to fall and population growth has remained low. Now that's all quite different from Bihar in that period. Uh, in Bihar, education levels were low, women were largely excluded from the labor market, Feudal power relations restricted migration, forward caste dominated politics and the economy, and the impact of social policies was limited. Uh, population growth remained high. Uh, there was some industrial development in Bihar in the 1950s and 1960s, large scale public sector mainly, but it stalled along with industrial, industrial development in much of, of India in that time. So, what I'm arguing is that by the 1980s, the social foundations for accelerated growth had been put in place in Tamil Nadu, but not in Bihar. And that's a significant part of the explanation for the substantial, for the divergence in their growth paths. Lots of other factors as well, of course. After 1980, uh, in the latter, part of the 1980s and in the 1990s, uh, Tamil Nadu started to implement a real industrial policy, take advantage of deregulation, integrate into industrial production networks. There are successful measures to encourage uh, both local investment and, and FDI, <coughs> significant FDI flows into Tamil Nadu. Um, earlier investments in education helped to increase the availability of skilled labor, there was also some growth of local entrepreneurship and capital accumulation among, among some intermediate castes who moved out of agriculture into industrial activity. And the result of all that is that the passive investment and capital use in the Tamil Nadu and Bihar economies has been completely different. In 2009-10, um, investment accounted for just 22% of final demand in, in Bihar, the lowest in the country against 42% in Tamil Nadu. Private capital in registered industry in Bihar accounts for just 0.3% of industrial capital in India against 11.4% in Tamil Nadu. Both the capital output and the capital labor ratios are higher in Tamil Nadu. All this process generated a growth of formal, regular employment in industry. Now, it's interesting to compare the acceleration of growth in Bihar in the last decade, with that acceleration in Tamil Nadu 30 years ago, because they're both similarities and differences. Tamil Nadu growth, my argument, it rested on a foundation of social policies, investments in <coughs> infrastructure and human development. And in reality, in Bihar, similar, pro similar policies have been 
been put into place in the last decade, and arguably this should provide the preconditions for an emulation of Tamil Nadu's success, although there are long time lags before these, before these policies start to have an effect. But on the other hand, Tamil Nadu's industrial development is very hard to replicate because the dynamics of industrial growth mean that those who get in first are able to establish a position. Once the growth path is established, the dynamics tend to suck in capital and, and labor, reinforce its advantages, um, and Tamil Nadu is, is networked already into industrial production systems and high-tech services at the national, to some extent, the international level, in a way which, which Bihar is not. Much harder for Bihar to cross that threshold as a late camera, which is an important reason why Bihar depends so heavily on construction and, and services, and Bihari workers seek industrial employment elsewhere in India. That there are other options. Agriculture is much more important in Bihar, and uh, there's probably a potential for agricultural growth and agri agro-processing, which provides an alternative. But the but the Tamil Nadu path is probably not a hard well, I don't want to give too rosy colored a picture of Tamil Nadu. Um, uh, the gender wage gap is larger than in Bihar. Good social provisioning has gone alongside deteriorating lead markets. Inequality is high and it's been growing. And there have been widely reported problems of governance in Tamil Nadu in recent years, to a point where it may be time to repeat the visit of IAS, IAS officers from Tamil Nadu to, to Bihar. But, the, but the, the comparison gives some ideas about things that worked and things that didn't. Northeast Brazil provides a completely different, but also in some ways interesting comparison. Because in Brazil, like in India, there's very considerable regional inequality. Brazil's much more urbanized than India. Uh, the capita income is three times higher in purchasing power parity. But the, there's an experience of regional inequality which has some relevance for Bihar. Today, the Brazilian economy is dominated by the southeast, um, and the northeast is a relatively deprived region. On the map, they look like they're sort of next to each other, but Brazil's quite big. So the, from the top of the northeast to the bottom of the southeast is about the same distance as from the far north of India to the far south of India. Um, but the, the Northeast, although it's deprived today, once upon a time, like Bihar, it was the political and economic center of the country. And for the first 250 years of uh, Portuguese colonization of Brazil, uh, the capital city was Salvador de Bahia in the Northeast, and a slave-based plantation economy produced sugar for export. But to summarize centuries of economic change in a couple of sentences. The surplus wasn't invested in the local economy. Exploitative agrarian system stagnated. And as you course, the center of gravity of the economy moved south to Sao Paulo and south surrounding areas in the southeast of, of Brazil. Sao Paulo became center of large-scale industrial production in the first decades of the 20th century. A capitalist accumulation process created an industrial proletariat proletariat which was fed by migrants from the northeast and from Europe, and the northeast fell behind. The share of outputs of the population fell rapidly, fell steadily. It's about 50 million people today, so say half the size of, uh, of Bihar. Now, of course, the, the comparison with Bihar is, is rather approximate, but, but in both countries, regional backwardness emerged as the result of a, of a historical process in which political and economic factors were intertwined. There was, there was nothing inevitable about it, which means that it can also be reversed. So in the middle of the 20th century, both Bihar and Northeast Brazil were relatively backward regions. Um, then in the next 30 years, up to 1980, uh, industry boomed in Brazil. GDP growth averaged 7%. But the Northeast hardly shared in this growth. Uh, the dynamics favored the more advanced regions where industry and financial institutions were concentrated, which was the Southeast and Sao Paulo, where there were still the workers. 
And so by 1980, output per capita in the Northeast was only 40% of the national average. Now, in Brazil, it was recognized, and I think more than in uh, India, that regional inequality was a serious problem that needed to be addressed. The political environment of the Northeast was toxic, there was a lot of corruption, the economy was built around specific vested interests. That sounds a bit familiar, right? Um, po poverty, poverty was high, wages were low, unemployment was high, and both labor and capital flowed from the northeast to the southeast. And so you can see, see some echoes here of the situation of Bihar in the 1990s when the Indian economy started to grow rapidly and Bihar stagnated. In 1959, a, um, yeah, okay. in 1959, an institution was created specifically for the development of the Northeast, headed by the well-known development economist Celso Fortado, which in Indian terms is like if somebody like K. Raj or, or B. K. R. Rao or somebody of that level at that time had taken a similar post in a new institution designed to combat regional inequality in, in India. And that agency had a mandate to put in place incentives for industrial investment, raise agricultural productivity, improve transport infrastructure, and there were large fiscal transfers from the center to the region. Now, in fact, the impact of, this was a large effort, but the impact was relatively modest. But it did stop the relative decline of the region and the absolute growth of the regional economy, the northeast regional economy, increased. Then, 1980 was a point of inflection. There was a substantial change. The Brazilian economy slowed down, uh, did much worse than before. The Northeast did much better. There were also political economy changes. There was a new constitution in 1988 which guaranteed certain proportions of central government resources which had to be transferred to the regions. Um, in the 1990s, when the Brazilian economy liberalized pretty much at the same time as the Indian, um, substantial incentives were put in place for investment in the Northeast. And large, large industrial enterprises, both international and Brazilian, uh, increased production of consumer goods and intermediate inputs in the region. And so in effect, that the region, which was previously backward and declining, became part of the national industrial network, specializing in lower tech, lower productivity activities. It's quite the opposite to the pattern in Brazil, sorry, in India, um, where liberalization has led to a concentration of investment in the more advanced uh, regions of the countries. But the countervailing policies were much stronger in Brazil. So what happened? Faster growth in the Northeast for about 25 years. So the Northeast started to catch up. Um, Northeast started to catch up until about 2002, 2004. Then the growth rate, all growth rates in Brazil increased for a while. But then something else kicked in because there was uh, a very substantial change in social and, and labor policies. There was an expansion of cash transfer and anti hunger programs, which disproportionately benefited the Northeast because they had a larger, low-income population. Formal employment grew faster in the Northeast than in the Southeast. The national minimum wage rose, and that had a bigger effect in the Northeast, because the national minimum wage means something in Brazil, unlike in India. And the gain was, was greater where wages were previously lower. And the net effect, we can compare this a little bit with the first graph about long-term trends in um, in, uh, in, in Bihar, but this is about household income per capita from 1980 up to 2014. This is the northeast, the back of region, as a percentage of the southeast, the more advanced. And what you can see is that income sort of stabilized. 1980s, it, stuck, it hung around 40%, and then up to the 90s, there was a slow increase. As, as the regional economy grew, household income per capita also grew from 40 up to 45%. And then after, after 2000, uh, the, the right-hand side of the graph, uh, there was a steeper income, a steeper increase 
in household income per capita as households benefited from, from both higher growth and the increase in social programs. So here's a, decent, here's a disadvantaged region that has regained lost ground. Now there are, there are important differences with Bihar. It's much more urbanized, lead markets more full, many, 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 many differences. But there are parallels which are interesting. In the 1960s and 1970s, Northeast Brazil was a source of labor for industrial expansion in the southeast of Brazil. Uh, but at the same time, there was a large investment in education and infrastructure in the region, which ultimately paid off by supporting growth and migration and flows dropped. You could think that the same sort of thing may be underway in, in, in Bihar, with the, uh, and, and that ultimately the migration flows out of Bihar might be offset by the uh, by the improvements locally. Um, but once again, and it's similar to the comparison with Tamil Nadu, there was a, a different pattern of integration in the national economy. Um, here, the northeast of Brazil was integrated into a national industrial network, uh, which provided an important impetus to growth. And in fact, the northeast of Brazil was always part of a rather coherent national growth regime. India, India's economic system is, is much less integrated, and Bihar has been on its margins. And to emulate Northeast Brazil, we would take advantage of the growth of the Indian economy. A greater degree of economic integration seems to be essential. And now, with my remaining five minutes, which John has kindly given me, let me just a few a few reflections to a few reflections, more general reflections to to conclude, drawing on these these comparisons. <coughs> Well, one really important difference between Brazil and India is that in Brazil there was an explicit regional development strategy for much of the recent period, which involves very substantial transfers from the centre to the regional programs. That's not the case here. The, uh, the transfers, the finance commissions. Um, Behind it's about the average, the, the, the national average in terms of the evolution of resources through the financial commissions, despite the fact that income per capita is much lower. Plan outlays tended to be higher in high income states. And, um, and in um, uh, Anjan Mukherjee's calculation, I think, was that uh, the um, total. Um, the capital total development expenditures in Bihar were only were not much more than half of the national average, also because of the lower level of resources within the state. So, so that's, that's a really important reason for divergence between states, um, uh, between Bihar and Tamil Nadu. And to emulate the Brazilian experience, uh, a real shift in the reallocation of central resources to low-income states, to be higher and other low-income states which be required. Second, it's not only resource transfers that are important, but the institutions and incentives to promote industrial development. Now, in both Brazil and India, states compete for industrial development, and that tends to root capital flows towards the richest regions that can offer facilities and special tax regimes. Tamil Nadu has been quite successful in that respect, in Brazil, there's a higher degree of coordination than, than in India to, to limit that, that competition. Um, the, the important thing is linking, linking international and international production networks. In Brazil, that linkage was a key to the turnaround of the regional economy, and it's important to Tamil Nadu. Bihar will have to seek mechanisms to strengthen that linkage. Third, Social policy as a foundation for subsequent growth. That was true in Tamil Nadu, it's true in Brazil, and it's going to be true in, in Bihar in the future. And the Brazilian experience shows that when social policy is implemented effectively across uh, regions with different income levels, it has a redistributional effect. In India, it's tended to be the opposite because social policies have been implemented more effectively in the richer states. Fourth, and almost at the end, Mr. Chairman, labor market policies are also very important. In India, we're starting to see some signs of competitive deregulation of labor market across states. But Brazil is precisely the opposite. 
the lead market was formalizing, and it was formalizing faster in the backward regions. Along with a rising mineral wage, it created the conditions to hold back out migration and support regional growth. Tamil Nadu hasn't particularly relied on poorer labor conditions. Casual wages are relatively high, uh, and um, there's been great investment in skill development and labor inspection. Um, in the case of Bihar, higher migration to other parts of India may help to raise living standards locally, but it doesn't necessarily lead to local development, because investment in skills and education is undermined by the outward flow of skills to other regions. So a focus on the creation of decent employment in the state is needed. The slow migration is necessary to, to create more employment opportunities for both men and women, and also to aim at improvements in both wages and conditions of work. In India, most evidence points to increasing divergence in growth rates between states in the post-liberalization era. In that respect, Bihar's recent growth has been bucking the trend, but there are dangers here. The state's integration into the national growth regime is incomplete, capital, capital accumulation is low, labor outflows are still large. The experience of Tamil Nadu and of Northeast Brazil suggests that these difficulties can be overcome, provided there are large flows of resources from the center to help overcome historical handicaps um, and continued efforts to build the social and infrastructural preconditions for growth. If that happens, there's good cause for optimism. Thank you. resist the temptation to get uh, some questions myself and because uh, uh, I don't actually think I want to contradict anything you said about Parliament, so uh, that's all right. <laughs> and so I open the, the, this uh, the presentation to, to your questions. Well, first over here, please. Thank you very much for this uh, comparative perspectives. Um, I'm very intrigued by you stressing several times um, the importance of uh, women and men integration into the labor market. So my question is from the comparisons to Tamil Nadu and Northeast Brazil, what can we learn about the why? Why is it important to integrate women? And the how, how did it happen? Thank you very much for, uh, for the detailed comparative analysis. I've been looking for a long time for a generalization across Indian states and come up with a model which would explain why some go up and others go down. Your work is certainly going to be a very important uh, contribution to that. I have two questions for you. First, you have a um, long timeline and it doesn't take into account the uh, bifurcation of the state. How does the creation of Jharkhand affect the uh, development of Bihar for once? Second, the model you are using appears to be exclusively endogenous. Are there exogenous variables that affect, such as remittances or the trade equalization policy? Does Bihar pay an excessive price for being part of the Indian Federation? The exogenous variables, such as remittances, um, do they play a role in Tamil Nadu and Bihar? Or for that matter, the threat equalization policy, which is a penalty Bihar pays for being part of the Indian Federation. Does it affect, does it affect Tamil Nadu at all? And uh, well, thank you, Jerry. It was very interesting to what you said. I particularly enjoyed uh, your comparison with Brazil because we can learn so much by looking outside. Yeah. Um, three questions I hope I remember. The first one is this that has been often commented upon by you, and you very listened to Hochi as well, but earlier that Bihar was a very well, was a very well governed state. 
I am not quite in agreement with that, simply because I didn't, don't think it was well governed. I think it was well flattered. The domination of the ruling people in Bihar was so complete that the lower class were flogged all the time. And therefore, on the outside, it looked as if everything was quiet, calm, and well disciplined. But there were fires raging underneath. In my view, that aspect has not been captured by either the British officials or the earlier Rambo Indian officials. I have. The second thing, you did mention caste and uh, the OPC reservation. And that, I think, is a very, very important point. I should like to add here that the caste structure in Bihar and in Tamil Nadu are very different. Primarily because in Tamil Nadu you had just the Brahmin caste who supposedly on top. And they came on top really with the British, the one quite that way earlier. And they were by and large urban, with Tanjavur being the exception. I've always wondered for a long time why do anthropologists always go to Tanjavur or Tanjavur? And eventually the, the penny dropped. But that is where all the caste fantasies of anthropologists come true. Because you have the Brahmins who are rich, Brahmins who are powerful, and Brahmins who are well, uh, work, well endowed in terms of land. But elsewhere in Tamil Nadu, that's not quite the case. And I, as I understand, you spent time in Coimbatore, so I suppose you must have made all the potential of the Tirupur. The third thing is, is simply this, that, and this takes up on the first question that was asked of you by of my colleague out here, that is this, that, you know, if you're talking about women and uh, the difference they make, one must take into account the difference between the Dravidian system of kinship and the North Indian system of kinship. Yeah. And the Dravidian system of kinship, I think, allows or it may, makes room for uh, women's mobility, uh, being able to get urban jobs and occupations, and also, as you will notice, the sex ratio in Tamil Nadu is exceedingly good, and what is more important is the sex ratio in slums is super. So you put all three together, I think we have a wonderful story as well to the one that you're pretty yeah, Thank you. Just for one more question. Okay, two. But let's be quick. Uh, thank you for providing the perspective. I'm just curious to know, in terms of the remittance coming to Bihar, from those who have gone outside of the country and those who have gone in, within, in the different states. Thank you. Okay, the back to last one. Run with it, please. <coughs> Geological condition of both these states are different. Is it not great hindrance in the development? I'm sorry, we didn't get that. Yeah? It didn't follow. It's just moving yeah. south. I have, I have said that the geoecological condition of both the states, that, that, that is TN and VR, is different. Is it not the great hindrance in the development process?
but family structures are different. Women are more autonomous. Uh, there's much higher labor force participation of women, but it has historical roots. You know, it goes back to slavery, and it goes back to the construction of the industrial system, so that you, 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 you have to put it in a long term, that was your question, yeah. You have to put it in a much longer term historical context, and it surely influenced the, the pattern of growth, and above all, the pattern of participation in that growth. I mean, it's, I think it's a, it's a lecture in its, in its own, in its own run. I think it's a really, so, so these, these gender differences uh, need to be integrated into understanding the, the, the particular growth paths of, of, of these different situations and, and, and of others. Um, uh, and, and, in, um, and in Bihar, we know that so the, uh, the opportunities for, for women have not been opened up as, as, uh, as growth has created new possibilities and migration has created new possibilities the possibilities for women have been limited. Um, the, uh, the, the role, okay, the development of the state, there, there are a number of, you, you have to, to, to try and pick out a few points uh, when, you're, when you're skating over the surface of, of large histories and large, large countries. Oh, the, the development of the state in these different illustrations has, has, has been quite different. Um, uh, although the, the way in which the state is developed in, in, in Tamil so, some of the issues of, which are today on the agenda in, in Bihar in terms of how improved governance has played an important role, that was clearly uh, an important element in, in Tamil Nadu as an earlier point in, in, the, in the growth of the Tamil Nadu economy. I don't think I can, can, can develop that further, but the, but the, the issue of, of remittances, I, I, I did explicitly mention the issue of remittances because it's one of the ways in which each of these um, regional economies integrates with the rest of the world. There are high remittances into Tamil Nadu. There are international remittances mainly rather than national. In Bihar, it's, it's dominated by, by remittances within the country. Um, the, I don't know enough about Tamil Nadu to know to what extent remittances are actually feeding into a process of capital accumulation in Tamil Nadu, but I would rather suspect that they do in a way that they don't in Bihar. So, so these linkages, it isn't, I wasn't trying to put, uh, uh, explain things in an endogenous way, these are exogenous factors which have an impact. And, um, and Deepankar's point, um, the, the role of, to, to, too much, to go to the role of Brahmin, um, uh, Brahmin I, I had a draft of what I'd written about Tamil Nadu and I showed it to a Tamil Brahmin friend of mine to ask him what he, or what he, what he thought of it. And, and, and he said that he thought that there was some, some, some truth in the story that uh, the, the, the Brahminas expelled from agriculture were actually uh, an important part of the growth of industry because there was a shift into industrial entrepreneurship, which was cut. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so, that, um, so I think um, that the, the, these class interactions have played out in a, in a completely different way in, in Tamil Nadu and in, in Bihar, which is perhaps not surprising given that the, the history of caste in the two states is, is, entirely, is entirely different. Um, and Dipankar also made a reference to the fires raging underneath, which I think is, is a good way of, of entering the story of, of, of nationalism and violence in the countryside in Bihar, but I don't propose to do so. Jerry, thank you very much. I think with that, uh, we have to, uh, to draw this uh, very good session to a close. Thank you very much. Thank you all.